Hi, everybody. Welcome to the case presentations uh, for DERM 2023. I am very happy that you're here today. If you are watching this content before the conference, enjoy, but we definitely look forward to seeing you in uh, Vegas in August. It's going to be a fantastic conference. It always is uh, celebrating our 10th year with an amazing theme and a lot of exciting things going on, but most of all, lots of learning. This is the ultimate conference for the NP and the PA in our field. Uh, it really is fantastic, so I hope you love it. My name is Sandri Johnson, and I am a nurse practitioner in dermatology, obviously. I work in Raleigh and in North Carolina, in, and in Rocky Mount, uh, North Carolina, and I do general dermato dermatology, no cosmetic or anything like that. So I love everything that I do. I love my job every day. I want to present some cases today that are just kind of sticking to my head. They're actually fairly recent from the clinic. In dermatology, you know, we see a lot of things that are the same thing over and over again, but these were just things that uh, stood out. So bear with me. We're first going to start with our first uh, young lady. And this case is the mysterious skin tag. The mysterious skin tag. At the clinic, we had a 52-year-old white female that presented with a bothersome skin tag typical uh, presentation, right? A lot of people come in with that. She denied any history of any trauma to the area. She hasn't had any uh, skin cancers, nothing that really concerned her. But this one little skin tag, even though it appeared benign, she wanted it removed. So she said, it feel different. I said, okay, well, if you want it gone, let's remove it. This is what that little skin tag looked like. Not much to see there. I'm like, okay, I see it's in a frictional area. We'll kiss it goodbye. The problem is, is that when we submitted this for pathology, as I learned long time ago, I do not cut anything and throw it away. It goes to a pathologist. That is just a best practice that I can always give you. Don't throw things away. So when this pathology comes back this past Friday, actually, uh, or Thursday, the uh, uh, Thursday before the 4th of July, it says that uh, the uh, uh, results are consistent with a focal dermal mucinosis. And this was my face. I want to go on vacation. It's supposed to be just a skin tag. So what is a focal mucinosis? A solitary cutaneous focal mucinosis is a primary uh, cutaneous mucinosis. And this is a lesion that has been reported in about 182 individuals. It's not very common. Most of the patients where we see these conditions, and this is my first one, are between the ages 29 and 60, uh, with more of a slight uh, male predilection. Of course, my patient is a female, uh, 52. Uh, the benign lesion usually shows up asymptomatic, and it's either a dome-shaped papule or a little nodule somewhere in the extremities or the arms and the legs. For Our Lady, it was in the uh, left uh, axillary vault. The appearance can vary from a whitish to red to flesh colored. Ours was whitish to flesh colored. And, but given the variable and generic morph uh, morphologic uh, presentations, uh, it's rarely clinically diagnosed. This is not something that you're going to see in the office and say, hey, that looks like mucinosis, right? No, it will not. So the uh, predominant pathologic feature, uh, what we would see in histology, is this encapsulated mucin, which is a hyaluronic acid complex in the upper dermis. And that can be visualized really with your standard H&E uh, uh, stain sections if you get to see those. Uh, I was uh, previously uh, uh, really fortunate that I was in a, uh, uh, in, uh, in a clinic that had a lab there. So I could see these things under the microscope, but I've never seen this one. But H&E uh, uh, stains, they are familiar with that. Uh, and, but there are also some stains that can demonstrate uh, mucin, that is the, your alcyon blue, the colloidal uh, uh, iron, or the uh, toledine blue. So th that can be helpful in confirming. And this is what that would look like under the microscope, under this higher magnification of a colloidal uh, iron stain section, you can see that solitary cutaneous focal mucinosis with that deep blue staining that is confirming the composition in the upper dermis being mucin. So what's the big deal? What is it about this? It's still just a skin tag, right? Especially the Friday before the 4th of July. So what do we do? We ask Dr. Google what we always do, right? Dr. Google is always right. So once again, going back to focal mucinosis, uh, this is a term that was actually coined back in 1966 by Johnson and Helwig. 
not me, Johnson, a different Johnson. Now, later in 2004, Chen uh, referred to the condition as a solitary, soft, uh, fibroma-like polypoid mucinosis, very much like what my lady had, right? More of a polypoid uh, lesion. But then fast forward in 2016, and quote, suggested that this lesion should be called a solitary cutaneous focal mucinosis to differentiate that from patients that actually have multiple of these lesions, because there is a problem with having multiple lesions. Uh, so what is it that I do? I remove just one of these lesions on this patient, but now reading more and more of these articles in Google, uh, I can see that a lot of times patients uh, will present with multiple lesions. And sadly, those patients have been found to have these lesions associated with other systemic disorders like sclerosis,derma, uh, lupus, thyroid disease, etc. So then I start going, I guess I'm going to have to delay my vacation a little bit more because then it became, of course, reasonable that we need to investigate further. So to perform laboratory data is something that is standard when you see something like this show up in the body, especially if there are multiple of them. So I call the patient and say, hey, listen, we found this uh, unusual or unexpected finding in your little skin tag and told her what the association was. And the issue being, of course, is that she had other lesions around it. Here is the original picture, but you see where the arrows are pointing that she had more. So we decided to go ahead and work up. Uh, we gave her a laboratory workup, and this includes a whole lot of stuff. You want to know, you want to do your ANA and your standard lupus stuff, right? With your anti double stranded DNA, your uh, anti RNP, a CBC, a CMP, an A1C, a scleroderma uh, workup, uh, also Smith antibody, your Sjogren's workup, and thyroid as well. So for her, it actually turned out to be pretty easy. So I don't have any kind of uh, great uh, uh, ending here other than her lab work was completely normal. So she was happy to see that. I was happy to see that. We, uh, When we removed the lesion, the lesion was completely gone. So we decided that we're not going to do any more treatment. She's just going to watch the area, keep an eye on the spots. If she starts uh, developing uh, many more and we feel they might be related, we will probably go and remove some more and continue to check. But overall, she's 52. She's healthy. Um, and uh, so we're going to leave it at that. And that is the end of the mysterious skin tag. I do have some references here if you wanted to look into uh, this condition of mucinosis. Lots of references. Sorry. Um, how about we go into case number two? This case actually involves two people and they came into the office in 2022. So in 2022, I am calling that the year of the painful crumbling nails. Nobody wants that. So here's what happened. These two ladies, two separate ladies, they're unrelated. They don't know each other. They're not um, uh, coming together or nearby. Actually, they came almost one year apart. They came to the office and they both were complaining of their nails breaking apart, crumbling, lifting, snagging on everything. Uh, very painful. Sorry, I had a fuzzy. Um, so for the uh, sake of uh, anonymity, uh, anonymity, uh, we're going to call them Thelma and Louise. Uh, so they both came and they both had nails, uh, fingernails and toenails that were experiencing these symptoms. And it had been going on for a while. They each had gone to different uh, uh uh, dermatology offices within our towns, and they had both been treated with a 90-day course of terbinafine. It didn't work. So they then came to me quite a few months after uh, failing terbinafine, looking for a second opinion, and this is what they looked like. So Thelma is a 26-year-old lady, and this is what she looks like. You can see here that her toenails, both great toenails are very thickened, deformed. They're actually lifting from the nail bed. They are breaking apart. They have uh, shards of nail that are snagging on things and quite a bit of uh, inflammation uh, periungally. Her, uh, this is her right thumbnail, but actually her left thumbnail looked the same way, was starting to experience the same symptoms. 
On the other hand, we had Louise. Louise had had this problem longer than Thelma. And the pictures don't do it too much justice, but if you look at the photograph on the right, she's basically missing her nail. She just has shreds of nail attached to the nail bed. The nail bed is red. It looks painful. You can even uh, see on her right uh, uh, ring finger that there's a, a hemorrhagic stain there as well. Um, this made me cringe. And, and I was in pain just looking at her. We had her take off her shoes and we could see in her toenails that specifically both great toenails were also involved. So yeah, I know somebody already treated with terbinafine, but this is, you know, you know, horses are horses and zebras are zebras. So we cultured anyway. And this is just a representation of one of the cultures that indeed there was no fungal growth there after four weeks. So this was not onychomycosis. And then I remember, wait, wait, wait. I've seen this before. I've seen a couple of things that look like this. I've seen lichen planus that looks like this. And I've also seen alopecia areata that looks like this. They don't have any uh, signs of hair loss either. And there's nothing on their skin, but I'm pretty sure this is lichen planus. Lichen planus of the nail is basically a diagnosis of exclusion. But do I remember what do I do with it? No. So back to Dr. Google I go. And I started studying, of course, about this uh, nail lichen planus and what I can do about it. Number one, we know that uh, uh, lichen planus is actually a mucocutaneous disorder uh, that affects the skin. It has those uh, 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 Papules that are flat, uh, that tend to be purple and tend to be itchy, and neither one of these ladies had any involvement of their skin. We looked into their mouth. There was nothing in their mouth either. So for some people, it's just involved in the nails. We know also that the occurrence of lichen planus has been reported in about 10% to 15% of those patients that have lichen planus. Uh, lichen planus is more common in adults than in children, and it mostly affects the fingernails than the toenails, but both of our ladies had it everywhere. Uh, the many uh, nail abnormalities found in the nail uh, depend on the location, whether it's involving the matrix or or the nail bed, uh, you can often have a pterygium and that is when you know you're pretty advanced into the disease and it's irreversible. So that I was glad to not see in either one of our uh, ladies. However, the disease can lead to permanent disfigurement, uh, which is not only a psychological consequence of my nails not looking great, but specifically Louise, she had to wear band-aids constantly on her fingers just to be able to function, just to be able to put her hands in her pocket or into her pocketbook. So early diagnosis and prompt treatment is extremely important to prevent the development of the pterygium or the complete nail loss to uh, begin with. This is not an easy diagnosis because you have to differentiate it from these other disorders, whether it's psoriasis or uh, uh, areata and of course onychomycosis and especially hard if you don't have any other findings like in the skin you know in the back in the uh, surfaces of the wrist or the ankles or the mouth that can clue you into a lichen planus like disorder we know that systemic corticosteroids are the first line treatment but the outcomes are completely inconsistent so i'm looking for options at this point uh for these uh two ladies, well, initially for uh, for uh, Thelma, because she came at the beginning of 2022. Louise uh, didn't come until the end of 2022. So what is it that we see with the uh, uh, nail lichen planus? The typical characteristics uh, can include, uh, include nail atrophy, uh, longitudinal ridging and fissuring, distal splitting, uh, tracheonychia, the erythema of the lunula, nail plate thinning, onycholysis, onychorexis, subungal hypokeratosis, pterygium, all these words that are very hard to uh, pronounce, you'll find them in the EDBD nail. Pretty horrible. Um, it can, we also already mentioned that it can uh, occur independently or in association with the mucocutaneous uh, version. So, what is our differential diagnosis here? Is, uh, you know, any type of onychodystrophy uh, from onychomycosis or uh, psoriasis and alopecia areata, and of course, uh, trauma. So I pulled these pictures from Google because my photographs, I didn't have a really good close-up. We take our photographs in the office with our iPad and it's just not that great yet. That is something that we're looking into changing is to actually have a high resolution camera in the office to have uh, better photography. But these are from Google and the one with that gentleman's hands 
not that great a picture either, but you see that he is basically missing his nails and you see hemorrhages there as well. I, I feel that pain as I look. So what are the current standard treatments right now for uh, nail uh, lichen planus? We know that systemic uh, steroids are necessary to halt this, uh, the disease. You want to catch it early and try to stop it and preserve that existing nail. It also talks everywhere about intralesional corticosteroid matrix injections. Ouch. Uh, but basically you can, you know, spray a little of the uh, cold spray and inject in there. You uh, mix this with lidocaine and it's very effective, apparently very well tolerated. I did bring this up with the patients. They weren't too happy about that idea. Some people have tried also intramuscular corticosteroid injections, uh, like a Kinolog injection uh, monthly for five or seven months. So this is a long treatment. This is not something you're going to fix in a couple of months. And we know that, right? Nails are not fast to grow, but this inflammation specifically in the nail just takes a long time. But there's been some good efficacy uh, with intramuscular uh, trimestalone injection. So then as I continue my search in Dr. Google, this is what I run into this very cool um, article uh, somewhere in Europe. I can't remember where right now. And I guess you can kind of tell with the uh, last names and it was written towards the end of 2021. And they tried very sedative. They tried it on a 60 year old lady who had recalcitrant nail lichen planus. Uh, she had uh, failed oral, oral uh, corticosteroids, um, also methotrexate, and she was at her wit's end. So they said, hey, let's put her on some uh, very sedative, also known as Olumiant. And they put her on four milligrams of baricitinib. She did well. Within four months, she was growing a normal nail. It took longer for her to uh, to actually get the full nail uh, back normal, but she did well. I don't have photographs of that, but at least you can look this uh, article up. And she is now on a maintenance dose of two milligrams daily. So that is really cool. So, hey, maybe I can try something new is what I said. I'm like, I'm not a fan of steroids. Why would I put someone on prednisone at high doses for so long? Makes no sense to me. But uh, the Jacks, you know, were coming in last year with uh, some um, concerning uh, issues uh, in uh, so I was a little hesitant. So I talked to the lady, Thelma, you know, I started seeing her January of 2022. Uh, I did not have this as an option. So actually, you know, we had talked about jack inhibitors, but she didn't want to try any kind of injection and she was trying to get pregnant. So uh, the jack inhibitors were not even an option for her. She opted to actually go on oral prednisone. Lu Louise, on the other hand, she's 40. She also had zero interest in getting any kind of injection in the nail. And she didn't want oral or injectable prednisone either because she had experienced bad side effects. She talked about the insomnia. She said she was this close to being psychotic with a uh, 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 prednisone in the past. So her being otherwise healthy with no history of any kind of thrombotic uh, episodes or cardiovascular risk, she actually opted to go on baricitinib four milligrams daily. And that was back in December of 2022. We gave her some samples and we got her sta started. Even though we really don't know what the pathogenesis of lichen of nail lichen planus is, well, lichen planus altogether is not completely understood, but it is speculated to be a T cell mediated autoimmune disorder, and it has many potential uh, triggers that play a role. Play a role. We also know that baricitinib can inhibit that T cell proliferation and the differentiation of T, uh, Th1 and Th7 T cells, and it does it via uh, the JAK1, JAK2 pathway. And what that does is that it down regulates those cytokines that tend to be upregulated on people that have inflammatory disorders. It does it inside the immune cell via the JAK-STAT pathway. I'm not going to go heavy into baricitinib and how to use it because there's no indication for nail like planus, but there is a package insert with other indications. And I did put a link here that you can copy and paste into your um, or, or at least write it into your browser and look at the package insert for uh, baricitinib. So let's go back then to Thelma. Thelma did not go on baricitinib. She stayed on prednisone. I don't like putting pe people on prednisone at a fairly high dose. I consider 40 milligrams daily a fairly high dose. And she stayed on that dose for four 
months. Uh, and then by the time we saw her again, she was getting some new healthier growth. So we dropped her dose down to 20 milligrams daily. We did that another four months. Um, and then we finally dropped down to 10 milligrams and she's maintained her trend towards improvement. She's still on that dose right now. She is uh, not, has not been able to conceive yet, but hopefully working hard at it. And this is what she looked like in May. I'm not sure if you remember the uh, pictures uh, that we, that you first saw, which were actually in, um, uh, I believe January of 2022. Uh, her nails don't look a whole lot different, but in the toenails, you start to see a little sliver of new nail coming in and that thickened nail is starting to get pushed out. That got me excited. And that's when we said, let's stay. Let's just drop it a little bit because the 40 is a little bit much. And let's go down to 20. So then if you fast forward over to January of the this year, then you can see an amazing change. Her uh, thumbnail looks incredible. Her right great toenail is in really good shape. The left has mostly some discoloration that has remained there, but it doesn't look bad at all. She's actually really, really happy. And this is what she looked like just a couple of weeks ago where it continues to get better. And finally, that left great toenail is actually catching up with the other ones. You see the uh, uh, thumbnail is actually Pretty, back, pretty much back to normal. So she's staying on the 10 milligrams for now. Not sure where we'll go from here. I guess maybe continue trying to drop it into a very low dose. On the other hand, we had Louise. And Louise, even though she was tolerating bericitinib pretty well at the four milligrams daily, she was not seeing the changes that she was hoping for. I think we got Louise a little too late, right? This is an emergency of the nail and we really need to be able to, uh, to catch it early and intervene hard and heavy. Uh, she hadn't had any laboratory abnormalities. We, we did a baseline uh, workup, the standard Jack workup, and we repeated that at three months and she was doing for, uh, really well. So she stayed on it altogether for four months. By the time we saw her though, she was uh, having acne, which is, I guess, not really one of the uh, side effects that I had seen with baricitinib. We had seen it, seen him with uh, uh, Rimbogue with uh, Uparicitinib, but not with this one. But nevertheless, the acne was there. She was very discouraged because the acne was leaving uh, dark discoloration on her face. And he had this beautiful, beautiful complexion. And we were kind of messing that up. So she said she wanted to come off. She wanted to come off the baricitinib. And I said, well, you know, we we can try other medications like methotrexate. We can uh, consider prednisone again. So we talked about it some more. And she said, you know, that prednisone experience was when she was a teenager. She felt she might have been maybe a little too dramatic back then. So she wanted to try again. So we switched her over to prednisone the 40 milligrams uh, daily. We started that mid-May. And right now, uh, today is June 30th. And so by the time I was writing this presentation, she's been on it for about six weeks and I'm not due to see her again until another couple of weeks. So maybe if you see me in the conference uh, in August, I'll try to make some, uh, bring some pictures of uh, Louise to the conference so that I can give you an update in person uh, about Louise. Uh, so, but here's uh, how she was looking. Uh, by January 30th of 2023, this year, the nails basically hadn't changed uh, at all. Uh, she was still in a lot of pain, very discouraged. Uh, this is a lady that basically was barely even making eye contact, that type of impact into her life. Then we saw her again in uh, March. And to me, the nails maybe looked a little bit better. She had been uh, moisturizing heavily with some vitamin E stuff. So maybe that is just what I'm seeing there, just uh, uh, better moisture of the nail, but no real change in the structure of the nail. And then we saw her again in May. And in this picture, you can uh, actually see that there is no nail there. Uh, her nails are pretty much almost completely gone from her fingernails. The toes uh, are still mostly there except for the uh, great, uh, great toenail. So that case is to be continued. I do have some references here as well for your reading pleasure. And I am so thankful that you uh, have given me your kind attention today to see some of those interesting things that I've seen in my office. And I hope to see you in Vegas in August. Thank you very much.